Grace and Bears, Trusting God in Times of Fear. This is week three. My name is Cassie Waits, and I'm so glad that you're part of our class today. In the shadow of COVID-19, we are being plagued by a second virus, a virus that we call fear. And while some fear is healthy, all too often, fear can overwhelm us and overtake us, crowding out the abundant joy that life in Christ offers. In this series, we are reflecting on fear, how scripture speaks to our fears and the powerful reassurances that God offers us. Last week, we covered the fear of not having enough, and we saw that time and again, our God is a God who provides. This week, we turn our attention to relational fears, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of embarrassment. And what we notice is that these fears take root, particularly when we tie our self-worth to the opinions of others. And what scripture assures us is that who we are is not defined by the world around us. It is defined by God and God alone. And according to God, we are not only made in God's image, but we are beloved children. So let's get our Bibles and let's get started. As we begin our time together, let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for this day and for this chance to gather, to study your word and apply it to our lives. May the Holy Spirit move in our hearts today. Open us up to your teaching and fill us with your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This week we tackle relational fear, and I'm defining that as a fear of failure, a fear of embarrassment, a fear of not meeting others' expectations. And the root of relational fear is that we have shifted the location of our sense of identity away from our identity in God, and instead we now see our identity, our self-worth, through the eyes of others. And this is how we fall into the trap of relational fears. Let's take a minute to reflect. When have you located your identity in another person? There are so many life experiences that might induce us into relational fear. Maybe you thought of an unhealthy friendship or relationship. Maybe you thought of a job situation that was just toxic. Maybe you thought of a life experience where you invested and invested and invested in another person only to realize that you had made that person the arbiter of your identity. This temptation to find our identity in others rather than in God is pernicious, it's sneaky. Sometimes we don't even know it's happening until it's too late. But we know when we've crossed that line because we know that we feel enslaved to keeping up appearances. We know because our relationships start to falter. When we're dealing with relational fear, we force our relationships to bear the burden of our need for God's love and acceptance. This is a case of misplaced identity, of tying our worth to the wrong things. But fortunately for us, we don't have to keep doing this. Scripture offers a counter example. In our scripture today, we meet three friends who are faithful to God and who, uh, who maintain their identity in God despite competing expectations around them. Their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we read their story in Daniel chapter 3. Let's read together. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1 through 18. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Notice the repetition in this story. So the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Who set it up? King Nebuchadnezzar set it up, just in case you missed it. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Who set that statue up? King Nebuchadnezzar. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of... The horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that, who set up? King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O oh, king, live forever. You, O oh, king, have made a decree. What was that decree again? That everyone who hears the sound of the... Horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that who set up? You set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready... When you hear the sound of, what were those instruments again? The sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble to fall down and worship the statue that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Notice the contest that's unfolding in this text. We have the power of Nebuchadnezzar to compel people to worship the god Nebuchadnezzar once worship the statue that he set up. And we have the power of the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there is a real question presented, which power is going to prevail? Is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's god more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonian Empire, the empire that at the time rules the world. This is not unlike the contest stories we find between Elijah and the priest of Baal in 1 Kings, or even the contest between David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. There, we have not just Goliath insulting Israel, but Goliath insulting the ability, the power of Israel's God to protect Israel. And again, we have this question, will God protect Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Here's the backdrop of this story. Around 587 BC, the Babylonians came through and they conquered the southern kingdom of Judah. Now remember at this time, there is no northern kingdom of Israel. It was conquered back in 722 by the Assyrians. So we're in 587. 
southern kingdom is conquered and a good number of the people in and around Jerusalem are taken captive and they are hauled off to Babylon. And once there, they are assimilated into Babylonian culture. And among the people that are taken off is Daniel. The name of the book Daniel comes from this guy, Daniel. And these three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. It is no small thing that when they get to Babylon, they are, they are not just relocated, they are enculturated, they are also renamed. And this is important because naming a person shows that you have power over that person. Parents name children. And this is especially true in a culture where a name carries more than just pleasant syllables. A name actually has a, a meaning and that meaning introduces you to a new person before they even see your face. They learn your name and they know something about you. And so we have these three friends with their Hebrew names. They show up in Babylon and they're given new names. This is a big deal. But if we look at their Hebrew names, we know something about them. So it's time for a pop quiz. What do the names Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah mean? A. God is gracious. Who is like God? God has helped. B. God will strengthen. God is my salvation. Grace. C. The stranger. God is my judge. He laughs. If you answered A, you would be correct. Hananiah means God is gracious, Mishael means who is like God, and Azariah means God has helped. Now, if you answered B or C, that's because some of those definitions come from other names we know in the Old Testament. And so take a look at your screen. I've listed out where all of those other definitions come from, and you'll notice some figures that might be familiar. So Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah do not get to keep their names. They are renamed. And their new names are not Hebrew names. They're not names that refer to their, their God. There are new names. And these new names refer now to the Babylonian gods. And so it's fascinating to see what happens in this renaming. Hananiah, God is gracious, becomes Shadrach, which means command of Aku. Aku is the Babylonian moon god. Mishael, uh, which means who is like God, becomes Meshach, which means who is like Aku. You see what's happening here. And then we have, uh, we have Azariah. Azariah, uh, which means God has helped, because becomes Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, and Nebo is the Babylonian god of wisdom. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego may have new names, but they do not let those names erase their identity. In fact, they hold on to certain practices that identify them both with the Jewish people and with their God. The first way that they resist enculturation is that they insist on eating only vegetables. The second way that they resist is that they insist on only worshiping their God. And it's this second resistance that gets them thrown into the furnace. So let's read now the second half of our story. Daniel 3, verses 19 to 30. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, True, O king. He replied, But I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed, their tunics were not harmed, and not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. You might have noticed that this story wraps up very neatly. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are vindicated. Not only are they vindicated, but the king now becomes a very vocal encourager of the worship of their god. Very vocal. Not only does that happen, but they, the three of them get promoted within the court. So what do we make of this story? We know that the book of Daniel is, is set in the time of exile. And what it seems to be speaking to is this question of identity. Where is our identity? Particularly, where is our identity if we've lost our homeland, if we've lost the connection that we had to the temple? How do we continue to identify ourselves as people of faith and as people of God? And this is the question that the whole book of Daniel um, is concerned with and a question that's really uh, a concern of this particular story. Because this story speaks so powerfully to identity and the question around where do we put our identity and whose approval are we really seeking, I think it's an important scripture, an important model for us to see as we struggle and wrestle with relational fear. What we find in this story is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, yes, parts of their identity are, are shaped by being exiles in Babylon, but the core of who they are and whose they are does not change. And they maintain their connection to who they are and whose they are by the traditions, the practices that they follow. And I think that that's why spiritual practices and rituals and traditions are so important for us. Our final question for reflection is this. How will you engage in a spiritual practice this week? When it comes to counteracting relational fear, Spiritual practices are some of the most powerful tools we have. And so it is no small thing that you have chosen to be part of this class, that you choose to join a Bible study, you choose to participate in worship, you choose to call one another, check in with one another, that you choose to pray for one another. These practices are the ways that we reinforce our identity as people saved by Christ and as beloved children of God.